I'd like to welcome you all very much to the uh, 2012 Beverage Lecture, uh, which will be given by Danny Dorling on Fairness and the Changing Fortunes of People in Britain, uh, 1970 to 2012. Let me tell you just a, a little bit about the Beverage Lecture. It presents outstanding speakers to carry forward the legacy of Sir William Beveridge. Uh, Sir William was uh, president of the RSS in 1941, um, as can be seen there, about the halfway down the, the second board. Um, he was an economist, he was a former director of LSE, and he's considered to be one of the founding fathers of the modern welfare state. Danny Dorning, the 2012 Beveridge Lecturer, is Professor of Human Geography at the University of Sheffield. He also holds uh, adjunct professorship in the Department of Geography at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, and he's a visiting professor in the Department of Social Medicine at Bristol. Uh, he was appointed in 2003 an academician of the Academy of the Learned Societies of Social Sciences. In 2009, he received the Gold Award of the Geographical Association and a back award, I'm not quite sure what a back award is, but I'm sure it's terribly prestigious, of the uh, Royal Geographical Society for work on national and international policy. Um, he's worked with the British government and the World Health Organization, and um, he's a very uh, prolific author. He's an author of uh, more than 25 books. Recently, um, there's one entitled Injustice, Why Social Inequality Exists, and another, So You Think You Know About Britain. Um, so, I, on, I said, said uh, a little bit about him, I'd like to introduce Danny to you and to ask him to deliver his Beverage Lecture for 2012. Thank you. Fairness and, and the changing fortunes of people in Britain is a key issue of our times. You see it in all kinds of places, or at least I see it in all kinds of places. On the bottom of that slide, you've got the now incredibly famous 1937 picture of two schoolboys from Harrow and three boys who hadn't gone to that school looking at each other uh, with quite a telling caption put on by the News Chronicle. And in the, I feel a bit bad given what's happened over the last week with the poor bank and, and the poor man, but on, on the top corner you have an image that went viral on the internet a few months ago uh, called If Pounds Were Pixels, representing the relative annual salaries of a hospital consultant, a top banker, and so on. And the point of putting these up is to show a kind of similar era of dissent again about what may be happening. But why am I talking to you about this here? Um, what is the reason, if I can click forward, for thinking that a group of statisticians should be interested in these kind of things? <laughs> the argument I want to make to you is that it's possible in various ways to try to measure fairness and whether we're becoming less fair or more fair. Uh, it was, I think it was Victoria's Jubilee when the Royal Charter was granted to society. And you can read there the words of the Royal Charter, uh, which included being able to collect and arrange and digest and publish facts illustrating the conditions, prospects of society in its material, social and moral relations. And this was a key part of the work of, of this society in its early years. I'll, I'll later on talk about a few of the people up there. This man is best known as being an economist, but you may not know he wrote articles and letters in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society before he was famous uh, for that. Um, but I've picked out another quote about the state of things here. John Maynard Keynes had a friend called Oswald Falk, and Oswald 
told him that all he'd really done with all his clever ideas and theory and suggestions about how we should change our thinking about economics to get out of a massive economic slump and depression was to codify the moral feelings of an age. There was a feeling of, almost a feeling of, I'm going to use the word disgust for 1929, 1930, 31, that we'd got to that state, partly out of the greed of some people. Um, things had got that bad. And then people like Keynes and other people as I'll show you changed some of their beliefs about what we should do. Here's our first person from the board. I didn't realise until I was in here earlier checking the slides and I looked down uh, that Major Greenwood was president of the society in 1934. And there he is in his valedictory address uh, describing what a statistician should do, talking about having feelings uh, as well. I got this quote from a paper by George Davy Smith and a colleague in which, the longer version, he also tells young statisticians not to be prigs um, and to, to not get too much on your high horse and, and so on. But to worry about the state of the nation, the state of today, issues about fairness, not just what happens to be the key issue, but the many issues uh, that, are, that are involved. And I've got a last photograph for you. This is another man I've never met. Um, I do hope to meet Tony Atkinson at some time. Um, a, an economist who, among many, many other things, still producing huge numbers of working papers and so on, uh, charts the income distribution in Britain, and particularly the incomes of people at the very top. My reason for putting up this diagram, it's one of his diagrams, isn't so that you can understand it or, or read it. It's so you can see how much data is missing because that's the real data. Um, one of the things I do, having not undertaken a PhD in statistics, I don't do clever statistics, uh, one of the things I've, I've done over the last 20 odd years is fill in gaps when people have estimated things but left things out because you can't get good data to allow you to show a clearer picture with the extrapolated data in the gaps. Uh, I've done this most and we have a project with six other people called World Mapper, where we drew a thousand maps of the world uh, with countries shaped according to various numbers. Now, if you do that, you can't have missing data because every country has to have an area. So somebody has to estimate what the number would be for Somalia of something that hasn't been counted in Somalia. That was my bit of the project. That's the kind of thing I'm involved in. And if you do the same thing, with Tony Atkinson's data, which is now held in the Paris Top Incomes data set. What you see, this is the course of change from around about 1910 to near the present day, is this incredible trend of inequality. At the very top, we've got the best off one in 10,000 people. Um, so the 1% of the 1% and how much they have from 1910 through to around about 2010. Around about 1910, 1912, the time when the Titanic sank, the richest 1% of 1% had annual incomes of around 400 times what, a, a, what an average person would be getting. That fell and fell with you know, some ups and downs, to an incredible low by the mid-1970s. The point of showing you this, and I'll show you this graph with various other ways of looking at the scales and so on, because of course the image changes as you change the scale. The point of showing you this is that there is a myth in Britain that we became more equal solely because of the Second World War. Now, if you look at that and look around the Second World War, you'll see that the Second World War was during the middle of the period in which we became more equal. But we were becoming more equal before it. And since the late 1970s, people at the very top have been taking more and more. But we're nowhere back to 1912. We're not back to there. Where we're back to is around about 1940. <coughs> you have to have good eyesight to see the red at the bottom, but the red's just the little people. They're the, you are fact, it's, it's lots of you. 
Uh, I'm very interested in the red. Uh, the red are the 9% uh, beneath the top 1%. Um, and I'll talk to you about them later. But same graph as before. We just changed the scale to a log scale, which allows you to see that this thing that was true for the very richest of the rich, the highest paid, 1 in 10,000, very similar pattern for the next group, very similar pattern for the 1% who are the green. Bearing in mind that I have filled in missing data, so in some cases the patterns are very similar because I've extrapolated from one to the other. There will be a published version of this paper in which I shade all the data that I have had to fill up. But if you don't do that, you end up being obsessed by the missing gaps and not getting the overall picture. Now, here's a few correlations. These are the only correlations. So if you're a correlation addict, you've got to get your full from, from this set of numbers. Uh, these are the correlations between those time series. Now, obviously, the correlations become higher when the data's been extrapolated because they're correlated. So the true correlations would be uh, lower than this in some cases. But what I find remarkable is that the fortunes over time of the top one in 10,000 and top one in 1,000 and top one in 100 people all tend to go together. When the super rich become more super rich, they're not quite so super rich, do better, and the top 1% do better. They all come down together, they all go up again together. But the correlation with the 9% is negative ever so slightly. Um, it changes over time. During the 1980s, the people just below the top 1% in society did see their incomes going up they're around about three times average incomes. But in general, the fortunes of those beneath the top 1% don't tend to correlate positively with the top 1%. This matters for lots of reasons. Massive negative correlations with the trend of the income share of the bottom 90%. Of course, because these all add up to 100%, you're going you're to get some of these, these things. That's the end of that, you've got two more seconds if you're feeling a lack of those kind of numbers. When I, when I look at these things and I look at these trends and <laughs> I look back at various ways of measuring things which suggest that in, in terms of how the gap between our incomes has gone back to the levels it last was in 1940 and is, the gap is still widening. So within a few years, we'll back, be back to the time of that picture, the 1936 picture, the Harrow Eaton match in terms of the gap. Um, and then I read things that people wrote in the past, and, and here's a very famous quote by George Orwell of his shock of finding that in Barcelona, I think in 1936, when somebody served him at a table, they looked at him in the eye. And it was a shock because in England, people who served you then didn't look you in the eye. And all I'll, all I'll say to you is just watch the next few days when you're buying a coffee or something else about the eye movements of the people who are serving you and the way in which we now interact again. I'll just leave you to do that. Um, it's not a very objective test. I can't tell what I'm thinking. Except that I was outside the British Library the other day and I was putting a bit of rubbish into a cup and the man came along and said, please clear that. Um, and was very upset to find that I wasn't a member of the waiting staff, but I was willing to help explain to him how together we could take the cup and put it into a bin. Um, and he really was upset at the idea of having to work together as equals to throw this cup away. Um, well, I won't go into any more strange things I do in my spare time. But here's another look at those exactly the same numbers, just different scales, different ways of showing it. Um, just to say you just have to do this. You know this as an audience. It, you know, you have to keep on changing the way you, you look at the same set of figures and see different things. If you can see the red at the very top, the point of those arrows is to overemphasize the fact that the 9%, the group that many of you are in, are getting a smaller share of income in, in recent years as the people beneath you get, get more. Can you read that from the back? Great, you don't need me to, to read out. It's just a quote from the Guardian newspaper, and a very recent quote. 
um, about current trends. We've kind of become used to these quotes, I think. I'm, I'm hoping you can multitask and read and listen at the same time. It kind of fits with that issue about whether waiters look you in the eye. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a paper, just two years ago, um, about young people and the, the collapse by now getting old. By young, I mean under 25. And um, the massive falls in the number of people under 25 in various jobs. And there were only about five categories of jobs which the under 25s were getting employed in increasing numbers in Britain about, about two years ago. And by far the most at the top was waiting on tables as waiters or waiteresses. Um, and then you go and read. Well, that might be part of the reason salaries have fallen. It's younger university graduates, um, amongst others. As you can see, I do too many of these, but if we had the light, I don't think we've got a light here. If you just take the red line and take it back, you can see that we're at a similar position again to the 1930s. Um, and more importantly, we're heading back in time. And you might begin to ask, so what? We'll get to the so what fairly soon and the many other things. Um, and not make you stay too long in the heat, so it might speed up a bit. The United States, very different, very different. In the United States, it really did happen during the Second World War. Um, and it was partly about coming out of that war, being such a victor, being largely unscathed, that you could afford to pay people at the bottom far more, and of course, you felt an obligation to it when they came back. But that's the United States trend. This is different to our trend. It didn't take a war in Britain to go from those ridiculous heights of inequalities in 1912 down to what I experienced as a boy in the 1970s. It was arranged, orchestrated, and so on by society, by conservative and liberal governments. Um, and I think that you need to recognise that, otherwise you, you can think, oh, it takes a war. Another graph uh, from the United States, again showing the importance of the Second World War in the US, but also how much worse the US got after uh, 1988. If you want an idea about what Britain could get like, we have a model, it's what happened in the United States of America, um, where 30 million people need food stamps to survive and so on and so on and, and so on. My favourite Daily Mail cartoon of all time, I have to thank Sebastian Kramer, who said I've never met him. He's a very nice man, he sends me lots of emails. He's there, brilliant. Um, there's a Daily Mail cartoon when the beverage report came out, celebrating social security um, and the fact that we're, we're getting it um, at that time. So it's a very different ethos to just a few years before the News Chronicle showing that picture with the caption, every, every picture tells a story. I lied slightly about the number of numbers, but these are easy numbers. This is just wealth estimates about what shares of wealth are now held by various people in society. Uh, to make these estimates, you have to do lots of estimation. For some reason, Inland Revenue seem to have given up producing decent wealth estimates from estates recently. Uh, but the Sunday Times does a wonderful job about documenting people at the very top of society. And ONS's survey of, of assets and wealth allows you to fill in much of the rest. And that's what I try to do there. Um, the 53% being held by the 1% is my, my best estimate, and I'd love people to email me and correct me and show me a better source. It's if you ignore your pension, because you can't hand that to somebody else, so you ignore the wealth tied up in your pension, and you ignore the wealth tied up in the house you live in, because you have to live somewhere, but you count the value of all those other houses you've got, and the, the shares and the stocks and everything else, the liquid wealth, the wealth you can actually spend or use to go on holiday. That kind of wealth, 53% of it now appears to be held by 1% of people. I happen to think it's incredibly economically inefficient to get to this point in the society. 
people often say that this kind of inequality is inevitable, that it's globalisation, that it's happening everywhere. If we're going to compete with India and China, we have to go along with it. Um, and what they never do then is to show you what happens and has happened in other countries. This is a situation in France. Uh, when I talk to my friends in France, they talk about the terrible years under Sarkozy. And I think if you're French, they might have been, but you can just about see the slight upward um, curve in inequality, again, from the Paris top income data set. Different countries went in different ways. I've just got two more of these to show you. Um, these, this is Cuba and Kerala, really radical left-wing countries. Well, of course it isn't. Um, this is Switzerland and the Netherlands. The top 1%, according to the Paris Top Incomes data set, have never had less in Switzerland and the Netherlands. Um, in Britain, the top 1% take 15% of all income, in effect leaving 85% for the rest of us. It's rather like, if you imagine having 100 children, giving one child £15 pocket money a week, and then for the rest, sharing out around about 85p each. Um, you can run a country very successfully without people at the top being paid as much. Bankers in Switzerland are paid less than half as much as bankers in London. They're not, they haven't all flocked to London. They do have the Alps. I do worry about this. If you had a choice between Geneva and London, particularly in this sticky weather, you know, maybe it does take that much. The Netherlands, m my favourite quote from the Netherlands is the boss of Shell saying, if you'd paid me half as much, I'd probably have done just as good a job, and if you'd paid me twice as much, I wouldn't have worked any harder. You don't hear people at the top of society saying that in more e unequal countries. Well, I, I just want to leave that and imprint you on, on, on your mind. Um, there's an argument that's gaining strength that says what the income share of the top 1% really is is a pretty good measure of how badly you're organising your society in general. So, at those times in which societies are badly organised, you're not working together and cooperating, a small group of people can end up with a very large amount of money. In societies which have more social controls and so on, um, your richest are still the richest and still getting a large amount of money, but not, not so much. And I like that argument because I think it helps explain a lot of things. I, I don't, I have to be careful because I don't upset any of my academic colleagues who probably believe this. I think inequality is a general measure about getting lots of things wrong. And so when you have a high level of inequality, you also tend to be not so good at other things. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example later to do with health. This is a Gini coefficient for those of you, of course, there isn't any room I can get to go to in Britain where people are more likely to know what the Gini coefficient is. Um, the point of showing this is it correlates extremely highly with the income of the top 1%. Um, people outside of this room really don't understand the Gini coefficient and almost never are going to understand the ratio of the area under the Lorenz curve. Um, but in fact, measuring the top 1% gives you a pretty good proxy for it, and more than that, there is, it's not really evidence, it's just, it's guesses and correlations, but suggestions that for a society where you've got a choice between having a slightly higher Gini coefficient or a slightly lower share of the top 1%, a slightly lower share of the top 1% gets you more, and that that's actually worse than overall inequality. The extreme example is Japan. The top 1% in Japan are very controlled, have uh, quite little income. Uh, Japan has the highest life expectancy in the world and many other things work. If you're at the bottom of Japanese society, the very bottom, it's awful. There is no social security. You're in a blue tent under a bridge. But for Japanese society as a whole, that inequality does not have a huge negative effect. Not that I'm condoning it. But Japan partly works so well because the richest in Japan are not allowed to become super rich for various reasons. Here's the life expectancy data. I'm putting this up because this was the most contentious graph or 
they use a different ratio in the book, the spirit level, but this was the weakest correlation in the spirit level. And I just think it's interesting to show it on this other measure. Um, the example I was going to give you about inequality making things not work is there are lots of reasons for this kind of relationship. Uh, material reasons of you have more, more poor people in more unequal country, psychosocial reasons to do with ill health. But being a geographer, I look for little geographical reasons to add on to these. In an unequal country like Britain, we know that the majority of our doctors, even our NHS GPs, live in those parts of the country where people have the best health. They're particularly concentrated in the nicer places, out of commuting distance to be able to get to patients who are iller. Our doctors do this because they're part of a society, tend to be part of a top of society, where the idea of living in a poor area of people of ill health for their whole life is quite difficult. So you end up with your highly trained medical staff not living near where they're needed. Now, if you believe that doctors help at all with health, that's part of the reason uh, why our health would be worse. In a much more equal country, you are much freer to choose where you live. Your doctors and everybody else are much more equally distributed. It's far easier to run a health service when they're trying not to live in mill towns in the northwest of England. Uh, the other thing I'll say about that gra graph is, is a thanks to the Danes. Um, yeah. Greater equality doesn't guarantee you things will be better. What that graph tells me is it's very hard for things to be very good when you're very unequal that way around. So there are very few, there are no circles in the kind of side of the triangle on my side. But you can be as equal and lovely to each other as you like and kind of have wonderful hippie schools and I don't want to stare it up. Sorry if you're Danish. It's my favourite country in Europe. But if you smoke a lot, you're still going to die earlier. And people in Denmark smoke, smoke more. Younger people don't know. The last of these kind of correlations, they don't prove anything. To prove them, we'd have to run several planets at once and do some simulations with other civilizations. My hope for extraterrestrial beings is that we can test out these hypotheses and, and see. Uh, but levels of poor mental health compared, again, to what share of income the top 1% have from WHO surveys. Uh, I've, on that last one, I do wonder about, you see Australia and New Zealand are kind of out of place. People should be happier there. And I just have a theory that that's those people who've just emigrated from Britain and are still <laughs> suffering, <laughs> suffering the effects of having yet worked out they've got away from the class structure anymore. Um, okay. Other things, I did promise in the kind of blurb for this talk that I would talk about other things than income and wealth. I just think at the moment income and wealth is incredibly important. And there was a huge amount more. This is my one token thing and you'll attack me for it. There are many other things. Why I am very worst in my work is about gender inequalities, about inequalities about disability and about race and so on and so on. It's just that at the moment in Britain, to be a prig in the way that Major Green would say not to be, I think we do need to worry about our extreme levels of inequality in income and wealth and the effects they have on us. This cartogram here is showing the blue areas are where children who go to university are most likely to go to a red brick or elite university. And you'll see, well, if you could see in cartogram space, I do apologise, but you'll see that it's south of the M4. So it's southern children uh, more likely to go to university than if they go, those are the universities they go to. Places like Sheffield and, and Newcastle and Leeds, which are also included in the 19 universities that Alan Milburn identified as being where the majority of the milk crown go who go and offer you high paid jobs. So there's this kind of roundabout in Britain where children in the south of England go to schools. The vast majority of concentration of private schools are down here. Only 2% of children in Sheffield go to private schools. Their schools are literally slightly better. They're catapulted up to universities where the employers turn up, who often the jobs that pay them higher. They zoom down to London at an ever-accelerating rate, still accelerating. Um, every year as we've produced more and more graduates since 81, higher proportion of our graduates nationally have come in to this city. Um, and that's higher now than, than ever. Zoom out of London again where they can't take it anymore in their 30s, worrying about schools, and bring up their children in those blue areas again to zoom up and out and round and so on. Not everything goes in the same way. 
There are lots of graphs and trends you can find that don't fit the inequality U curve um, and hence require work and understanding. One of the arguments about inequality is it tends to lead to more violence. People um, behave nastier to each other. And that is one of the main reasons why Britain has the highest rate of imprisonment in, in Western Europe. It's not that our judges are particularly vindictive, which is what was often thought. They are, when people study sentencing, they're actually sentencing people slightly nicer than on the mainland of the continent. Um, but whatever the reasons, the turning point isn't in the 70s or something like that. I'm aware of heat and time, so let's go further forward. I just put this up because I'm really proud of this particular map. Um, but it's just, this is a map from the 1981 census um, about commuting then, when commuting into London was at a low point. Um, so, you know, as you unbalance a country, as your prospects require, if you're a winner rather than a loser, to move in here or commute here and so on, it's not good for people in the south as well as people in the north. Um, this is a population cartogram of, of change over time in population in the 90s. It's a measure called population potential, which helps smooth things out. The dark green areas are where population has increased. Um, the purple areas are where population was actually going down in the 90s. It almost looks as if there was a plan for managed decline of the northwest of England. Um, but I don't think there was, but it's all kinds of things become unbalanced when you become a more unequal society economically because there's then a need to try to be in that group at the top more and more. The South is growing. This is just a population cartogram, a map in which areas are proportional to people. I've been drawing these things for 25 years, completely failing to have them adopted outside of academia. Uh, but it doesn't, and inside academia, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop me. This is the latest one. Any of you who are nerdy at all, uh, Ben Hennig, who I work with, drew this, and we're very proud of it because it's conformal. Every line of latitude and longitude is meeting at exact right angles on that um, map, which is hopefully you're more nerdy than the average set of people. So. I can't often explain my joy at those kind of things, the projections. Um, but as I've been drawing these maps for so long, I've noticed their shape changing um, and the shrinking that's going on. The colour, by the way, is altitude. So the dark green in London is the area that would be flooded if you hadn't built the Thames barrier. Um, getting rapidly towards the end. This is the share of the 9%. People at the top of British society, but below the top 1%. And just to point out how it's been falling as a share in the last five years, as our national GDP, so this is a declining share of a declining national GDP. Um, I think, politically, it'll be difficult to get away with people just below the 1%. The squeeze middle isn't in the middle at all. The squeeze middle is those just below the 1%, but they are being squeezed. Many other things appear related. This is a map of changes of votes between 2001 and 2010 general elections for the Conservative Party. The dark blue areas are the areas of the largest rise in voting for the Conservatives. The largest rise of voting for the Conservatives was concentrated in those seats where they had the most votes to begin with. It's hardly anybody left to vote Conservative, but they decided to vote Conservative too. This was disastrous for the Conservatives. This is exactly the pattern of vote swings you don't want if you're trying to form a majority government. This is why we have a coalition. If you measure the segregation <coughs> index of Conservative voters, I haven't got the graph here, but it follows that income distribution. Conservative voters are now as segregated, more segregated, I think, than they were last in 1922. So as your, as your population separates itself geographically, rich from poor, moves apart, migrates, parts of the country, you either meet Conservatives or Liberal, other parts, you either meet people who vote Labour or don't vote at all. Um, <coughs> these things are not good. A last graph from uh, Sebastian, which I haven't got enough time to explain, uh, with a quote from Alison at the back. So 
No, she's going to go and fall asleep on me. Um, <laughs> but it is a quote from Alison at the back. Uh, they're all about uh, birth ratios and how in economic good times when there was less stress, uh, the number of boys uh, that are born goes up. I won't go any further into this, but it's fascinating. For people who like statistics and numbers, statisticians have been obsessed by birth ratios for a very long time, and it might be profitably worth their interest getting a bit more obsessed, um, again, about, about birth ratios and the reaction between birth ratios and, and inequality. Not that the world necessarily needs more boys, but I'll leave that. I'm impressed by those of you still looking and peddling this, this heat. I'm just going to take that off. These are my conclusions. We've had this long period from 1910 to 1979 of all coming together again, of all being in it a bit more, and so on. The Second World War was important, but it was a punctuation in that period. Um, and then we've had a long period since around 1979 of all falling apart a bit more, of more going to those at the top. We've had a very strange period since the crash in 2008, normally after economic recessions income distributions actually come together again. They haven't happened. So quite what happens now, we don't know. I'm going to end you with a little story. Um, no more slides, but a little story, which I think helps to explain, for me, what happened in that long period. How did we get from 1910 to 1979 to be a more equal country? Now, we've got the right heat for it. We've got you up to that kind of that level to appreciate this. You've got to pretend that you're back in 1879 and you're in a town called Rangpur by the Ghat River in what's now Bangladesh. Okay, are you with me there? 1879, and you're pregnant uh, in Bangladesh and, and you're about to give birth to a boy and you give birth to the boy and you're going to call him William. And this is William Leverage. A few years later, William gets a sister called Jeanette Part of this is an old story. I've added things to this story. Um, I would love to complete this story. In 1882, when William is age three, all the way across from what was then India to London, at the AGM of this society 120 years ago, the Guy Medal in gold was awarded to Charles Booth. Charles Booth was a wealthy uh, man from a ship owning family who had done things like shown that 25,000 children in Liverpool, where his family were from, were neither in school nor work. And by 1892, he'd become president of the Royal Statistical Society. <laughs> by 1888, when this boy we're talking about in India, William Beveridge, was age nine, the word unemployment was first used in Britain, as far as I can tell. That was a great step forward. It suggested it was a problem or something you could do something about. It partly emerged because of work from people like Charles Booth, who began by arguing that levels of poverty weren't as bad and unemployment wasn't a great problem, undertook the Great Survey of London, which you'll know from the pictures and the maps of London. But he didn't actually do the survey on his own. He was the son of a ship owner. He didn't go around and knock on the doors. He employed a load of people, including school board visitors, the people who checked the children actually were going to school. And amongst the people he employed, he employed a young lady called Beatrice Potter, who wasn't the one who drew the hedgehogs. And I've learned recently spelt differently. Um, but he employed Beatrice to help him do this. At the same time, bear with me, William and Jeanette came over from what is now Bangladesh to England. Now, most people who come from Bangladesh to England, actually I think it was a narrow majority at one point, ended up in Tower Hamlets. Uh, but William didn't end up in Tower Hamlets. He ended up at Charterhouse and then Balliol. Uh, then, and he got a job as a graduate, uh, he ended up being an assistant for Beatrix Potter. But she changed her name. She married a bloke called Sydney and become Beatrice Webb. And she needed an assistant to help her work when she got annoyed on the Poor Law Report and decided to form a small minority to create a thing called the Minority Report. Um, but she didn't do all the work herself. She employed young William to help her do it. Meanwhile, at the same time as this is going on, remember Jeanette. I hope to be the first person who brought Jeanette into this. Jeanette was William's sister. Jeanette would marry another young immigrant from India, 
Uh, this man was actually born in Calcutta, and he went to England to rugby and then Balliol. So you can see how Jeanette met him because of the Balliol connection. Uh, William Beveridge and Richard Tawney lived together in Tolby Hall for a few years, and they were members of the 1%. These are people at the top of British society. Things happen to them that don't happen to the 1% anymore. Richard Tawney, William Beveridge's brother-in-law, was injured in no man's land in the Battle of the Somme and spent 30 hours out of the trenches. So I think that will have an effect on you. He wrote a book in 1931 called Equality. And if you're looking at William Beveridge and you're looking at what he wrote and how it changed, um, Jeanette and Richard and Tawney had an effect on him. And William became president of the society in 1941. When it came to William's time to write a report, when we got Charles, Beatrice, William, and so on, William was on the lookout for a young man. Um, maybe he was on the lookout for a young lady as well, but he found himself a young man to write a report. And he found a young graduate from Jesus College called Howard Wilson, um, who couldn't get a job as a teacher, and so had to do this awful job for this rather overbearing man called William Beveridge uh, on this thing that was going to become the Allied Committee report, the Beveridge report, and Howard Wilson becomes president of your society in 1972. This society has been intimately linked to that period of Britain coming together slowly over time at all kinds of points. I have more here, and I promise I won't go through them because I've got to my 45 uh, minutes and, and ended. Um, but this society has been intimately linked as being central, probably the most important of the British the London societies involved in bringing this country together again from that terrible period of the Titanic when if any of you on the anniversary of the Titanic looked at the death lists and look at what the chances were of people in those various classes dying, you got an idea about what British society was like then. My problem or my worry to end on is that I can't carry the story on from Harold Wilson. Um, and I would like to carry the story on from Harold Wilson. And I fear that part of the reason I can't carry the story on from Harold Wilson, and this isn't just this society, it's in general in Britain, is that that ethos and change and so on, for some strange reason that I do not know, in the late 1970s, late 1980s, was to some extent lost, which is why we have seen this rise get so big again, why we, in effect, waste so much money at the top in a time when we have less money overall. So my plea to end with is that the society looks at its history and thinks again to what extent it can contribute to shedding light on the issues of fairness and justice and shares and trends and what's happening. Don't leave it to economists like Atkinson. Don't leave it to people to study poverty like my friend David Gordon, who's a professor of social justice in Britain. So much of the work in this area is now not being done by statisticians and not involving statisticians. There is, of course, work involving statisticians, but nothing like the centrality that this society once had. And I think that now might be a time when there's a general feeling that there is a need for more of this again. Thank you for coping with the heat so much. and. Uh, please ask me any questions you wish to do. Thank you.